This primitive creature, with a 40-foot wingspan and no tail, flew the skies above North America 70 million years ago. The Northrop B-2, the stealth bomber, all wings and no tail, the most technologically advanced airplane ever built, is flying those same skies today. There is a link that connects this ultimate flying wing with its primitive ancestor across 70 million years. That link is a man, one of the greatest aircraft designers of this century, Jack Northrop. April 1980. Jack Northrop, now 84 years old, is taken to a highly classified design area of the Northrop Corporation. The company is bringing him back after 30 years of separation to share its closest secret. He has shown a model of the B-2, still in its early design stage. He is deeply moved. His mind goes back 30 years to his own crowning achievement, the revolutionary YB-49 flying wing bomber, an idea that died in 1950. This is the story of Jack Northrop's visionary pursuit of pure flight. It is the story of the flying wings. Nineteen ten, young Jack Northrop wanders by the sea, watching the gulls in flight. He's earning his way through Santa Barbara High School by working as an automobile mechanic. Like any boy at the time, he's tinkered with model airplanes, but he has no special interest in aviation. Jack Northrop has no idea that his genius as an aircraft designer is about to show itself. When it does, his reputation as champion of pure flight, searching for forms with high lift and low drag, will cause science to name this prehistoric flying reptile after Jack. They will call it Quetzalcoatlus Northropi. Quetzalcoatl was the winged serpent god of the Aztecs, and Jack Northrop is to become the champion of the flying wing but it will be 30 years before his first real flying wing will take to the air. In 1910, without knowing why, he watches the way the gulls can glide with their wings almost motionless, making the most subtle adjustments to cope with changing air currents. and he watches the way they can change their wing surfaces, using them to increase lift, change direction, and move around in the air in exactly the way they choose. This is a seed. It's four or five inches across with a single wing formed of delicate membrane. It comes from Indonesia and New Guinea a distant relative of the cucumber family. And it can fly. At the same time Jack Northrop was watching the gulls, aircraft designers in Europe were watching the stable flight of this seed and using the shape of its wings as inspiration for their own. The seed's wing shape was copied exactly by the Austrian designer Igo Ettrick in 1906. By then, the theory of the flying wing had been around for quite a while. Alphonse Penot's drawings had appeared in 1876, and Clement Adler's fanciful Avion I of 1897 failed to fly. The flying wing would have to wait. In early 1916, the Lockheed brothers arrived at Santa Barbara. In San Francisco, they built a seaplane largely by trial and error. 
They'd come to Santa Barbara to take advantage of the tourist trade on the waterfront, using the seaplane for barnstorming. Jack Northrup, now out of school, offered them his services as an engineer on their new flying boat. I had a little experience as a garage mechanic, and I had uh, worked for a year as a, as a uh, draftsman for an architect, and I'd worked for my father, who was in the building business, and this sort of qualified me to design airplanes, you can understand. <laughs> for the first time, Jack's design genius had a chance to show itself. But not without interruption, America entered World War I. Jack was drafted to the infantry, but was soon furloughed back to Lockheed to work on construction of flying boats as the war continued. The airplane was making its impact on warfare. Most of the designs of that era were biplanes, their two wings supported by masses of struts and wires, all of which created drag and reduced their flying efficiency. When the war ended, Jack had his first chance to experiment and innovate. The Lockheed S-1 was streamlined. Its lower wings swiveled to increase lift and the wings folded for transportation. But the S-1 was expensive when you could buy a cheap war surplus Curtis Jenny. Lockheed went broke and Jack had to wait for a job with a Douglas factory in Santa Monica. The morning I was supposed to report there, I went in with fear and trembling, my knees knocking together, I can assure you. And the first job they gave me was the designing of the uh, fairing on this particular uh, world cruiser airplane. This had a steel tube type of fuselage, and I was to design the, fus uh, the fairing for this fuselage. However, uh, my work in Lockheed had been largely in wood, in monocoque wood, and so I didn't know a doggone thing about putting a fairing on a steel tube fuselage airplane, and I was absolutely petrified. And along came noon, and I managed to gobble a little lunch, and this made me so ill that I went home. <laughs> Next morning, I approached the job again, not knowing whether I was going to last through the morning or not, but fortunately, somebody else had been started on the fairing, and I got a job designing aluminum gas tanks, and this I knew how to do, and everything was lovely. <laughs> By the 1920s, tailless aircraft were in vogue in Europe. These are the work of French designer René Arnoux. But the man who was to take this form of flight further than anyone else was still working on conventional airplanes. Jack's reputation was growing and spreading around the aircraft industry. In San Diego, the Ryan Company was building a mail plane, the M1. They were having trouble getting it right. Jack redesigned the wing, reducing its weight by 200 pounds. That same type of wing design was used on the Ryan NYP, the Spirit of St. Louis, and carried Charles Lindbergh across the Atlantic, from New York to Paris. But Jack Northrop's contribution to record-breaking aviation was only just beginning. I had a little drafting board at home, and in the latter part of 1926, I laid out a, a nice, clean, little high-wing uh, monoplane design. He took the design to Alan Lockheed, who was impressed. Well, the whole objective was to build as clean an airplane as we could possibly conceive in those days. The, uh, the average airplane had struts or wires or uh, fuselage forms that weren't as smooth, as streamlined, as low drag as possible. And it was pretty obvious, it seemed to me, that a full cantilever wing uh, neatly fared to the fuselage on a perfectly streamlined fuselage would take less power to do uh, a job than some other types. The design made use of Jack's growing expertise in stressed skin plywood construction. It was very strong, with very low drag. It was called the Lockheed Vega, and it took only six months from drawings to completion. It made its first flight on July 4th 1927. Later versions could cruise over 135 miles per hour with a top speed of 185. And in various forms, it created an amazing string of records.
Wiley Post called his Vega Winnie Mae and flew it solo around the world. Wearing this strange pressure suit, he created an unofficial altitude record of 55,000 feet. Amelia Earhart and her Vega became the first woman to fly the Atlantic. But although Jack Northrup was making a name for himself as an innovator in the design of conventional aircraft, he was preoccupied with another idea. Jack was ready to take his first big step down the road to the flying wing. I wanted basically to build an airplane where there was nothing but the wing, where everything was included in it, power plant, passengers, every function that was necessary in a wing. Jack set up the Avion Company in 1929 and built this almost flying wing. He got rid of the fuselage, but still needed the tail. Well, Mr. Bolandi, this plane is quite a little different than those you've been used to flying. Wings are all metal and plenty heavy enough and strong enough so that a person can walk all over them almost anywhere. All right, Eddie. Well, if you're all set, let's go. Goodbye, Eddie. <laughs> For its power, it was very efficient, and Jack was convinced he was on the right track. But he was in business to design airplanes that would sell. The first real airplane we built in this new company in early 1930 was called the Northrop Alpha. And this was built in a completely wing fuselage and tail surfaces of this monocoque sheet metal structure. The Alpha set a new standard in low wing monoplane design and was the forerunner of the Douglas DC 3. In 1931, the Beta appeared, a 300-horsepower sports plane that could fly over 200 miles an hour. The Gamma of 1932 pioneered high-altitude stratosphere flying. In 1933, the Delta set new standards in executive transport. These innovative planes became legendary for their performance and strength. In the early days, they flew just in the daytime in relatively good weather, but as they got some of the more rugged planes with the pilot well back, some of them were willing to fly these things. And we had a story, and I think it's true, about one of the early airmail pilots who was forced into a, into a restricted field and had to ground loop the airplane very violently in order to keep from going into a barrier, or a hill, or trees or something. And he bent the wing up at about 45 degrees. And they sent a crew out from Kansas City where the plane was based bent the wing down with some block and tackle and flew it back in for a more permanent repair. <laughs> but Jack Northrop's success with these conventional designs and his new partnership with Donald Douglas kept him away from his private passion, the high-lift, low-drag flying wing. Meanwhile, in other parts of the world, the cause of the flying wing was advancing. This English plane, the pterodactyl, had swiveling wingtips. Across the channel in Germany, Alexander Soldanov was making progress with a series of tailless designs. He'd been working on them through the 20s with growing success. Jack Northrup knew little of his flying wing work being done in Europe. In his head and in private, he was following his own path. Well, Dad was demonstrating to me how stable these flying wings were and uh, we went into the den, he cut one out for me, and uh, we started playing with it. I cut one out myself, and we used a wooden match and slit the end of it so that we could slide it onto the, uh, the paper wing. These are very fragile because they're made out of relatively thin paper, so I don't know how well they would fly. <laughs> In 1938, Jack left his partnership with Donald Douglas. He took a year off to think and experiment. He wanted to start a new company where he'd have the freedom to develop the flying wing and show once and for all that his theories would really work in practice.
But ideas, no matter how well thought out, were not enough. To take the wing past the model stage and bring it to life, Jack needed money, lots of it. And investors were hard to convince, especially about such a radical concept. Eventually, Jack was put in touch with Ted Coleman, who worked with an investment securities company. Jack went to a meeting to discuss financial possibilities. And as soon as he walked in the room, you knew that this man, although he had a reputation of being a great engineer, in addition was a great salesman. Because he put everybody at ease, and he was so natural and sincere and humble. He was an unusual combination. So he uh, told us that he had not succeeded before when he tried to form his own business because every time he did, one or two major shareholders decided when things got rough to sell him out to somebody else. And he said it happened too many times. And this time I wonder if you could sell stock in a new company, which I can, I can man and organize, with the help of Mr. Kohu, who is the businessman, uh, can you sell it to a, enough people so we don't have any large shareholders and people don't have so much invested that they're worrying about their investment? He said, I recognize it's a risk. Well, uh, Lamont spoke up and he said, gentlemen, he said, there's one thing about this. He said, the timing is right. He said, if you read the newspapers, you know that Hitler is rattling the sword. Hitler was indeed rattling the sword. And about the time he began the invasion of Poland, things slowly began to come together for the new Northrop Aircraft Company. It was a struggle, and it wasn't helped by the prospect of war and an unpredictable economic future. But in September 1939, as Hitler's troops marched into Poland, Back at Hawthorne in Los Angeles, building was beginning on the Northrop factory. Jack Northrop, for insurance reasons, had to file an application for a job in his own company. He demonstrated honesty, openly admitting to having been arrested for two speeding offenses. But his list of previous jobs was impressive and more than compensated for his poor performance on the road. One of the first buildings on the Hawthorne site was a wind tunnel, a place where Jack's dream, the flying wing, could be thoroughly tested. But Northrop needed work, and when the US Navy asked Northrop to bid against Douglas for the production of the Dauntless dive bomber, Jack jumped at the chance. He put in a low bid and was told by the Navy the contract was his. Celebrations began, but Jack's old partner and now competitor, Donald Douglas, intervened and had the decision reversed. Well, when Jack heard this, he said, come on, we're going to Washington. So back again we go. And this time, Jack was upset. And he said to the Admiral Towers, who was then in charge of the Bureau Air, he said, Admiral, you people have gone back on your word. You told us just a week ago that we had the contract. Now you say it's going to go to Douglas. We can't trust the Navy. Ted, I don't want you to ever come near the Navy again. Goodbye. And he came home. Well, this was quite a spot. Well, I at least knew enough about business to recognize that probably we had underbid Douglas so that it would have been very unlikely that we would have made any money on that contract. This is the Valti Vengeance dive bomber. The British, under threat from Germany, needed them in quantities Valti could not provide. Jack Northrop didn't like the vengeance design, but his company desperately needed the money. Valti uh, had a dive bomber that the British wanted, but the Valti were building a new plant in Nashville and they hadn't finished the plant yet. So, Lamont Coyu called Dick Millar, who was then president of Valti, and uh, 
Dick said was happy to give us a, a license to build the airplane. We turned over a million dollars for the drawings. They had already built the first airplane. So we didn't have any engineering, we just had to produce them. And so I came home with an order for 200 Vengeance Die Bombers and a, a check for $20 million. <laughs> and so they made me a vice president. <laughs> that contract put the company on its feet. A corporate spirit developed quickly. In no time, there was a staff newspaper, and staff sports clubs were established. Jack himself was involved, but the demands of a coming war were heavy. In the early 40s, he designed several distinguished warplanes, including the famous P-61 Black Widow Night Fighter. Like all Northrop designs, it was innovative. Over 700 were built, and it became one of the classic planes of World War II. In the meantime, Jack Northrop's mind was still wrestling with the flying wing design, but he wasn't the only one. The Horton brothers in Germany were making rapid progress on designs that were uncannily similar to the Northrop concept. Both parties, separated by the Atlantic, were unknowingly involved in a race along an almost identical track. But at last, Jack Northrop's time had come. The N1M, or Northrop Mach-Up 1, was completed in 1940. Its engines and the pilot were completely housed in an adjustable wing. It was very close to Jack's ideal of a completely clean design, totally committed to reducing drag and maximizing lift. Rosamond Dry Lake in the Mojave Desert, a hundred miles north of Los Angeles, a place of mirages and no water, and unlimited expanses of flat surface from which to test a revolutionary new airplane. The N1M was taken out into the desert for a long testing program that would run through 1941 and into 1942. With the N1M, known to its makers as the Jeep, went its support crew, and a very frequent visitor to the desert was Jack Northrop himself, talking here to test pilot Moy Stevens. The first public flight of the N1M was a great day for cameramen. Their pictures, shown on newsreel screens all around the country, gave the public something very new to talk about. A plane of unusual interest is demonstrated at Rosamond Dry Lake in the Mojave Desert. It is the latest model of the Northrop Flying Wing. Developed from designs originated by Mr. Northrop in 1923, this bat-like plane is devised to use all its service for useful lift. The elimination of non-lift elements such as tail and fuselage is what does the trick. The Northrop Corporation estimates that general application of this principle would result in speed increase up to 100 miles an hour with no extra power. And it is thought that this design will make construction 30 to 40 percent cheaper. It may revolutionize airplane engineering. This plane, as you see it, is really a flying laboratory. And in the present arrangement, represents one of 15 or 20 different configurations that we've tested in about 200 flights made to date. We believe that we've solved most of the problems connected with the development of the flying wing and that this type of plane will have considerable promise for future use. Details of the N1M's shape could be changed on the ground in several different ways. The wingtips could be made to droop to help stability, and the wings had removable sections so they could be adjusted for different handling qualities. The wingtip droop was rejected as unnecessary early in the program. This was the eventual standard layout of the one plane built exactly the layout of that same plane as it sits today in the Smithsonian Museum storage facility in Washington, D.C. P-51 
painstakingly restored to its original condition and color. At the height of the Battle of Britain, American military authorities became concerned that if Britain fell, America would need a new weapon. It would need a bomber capable of a special task, a bomber that could fly 10,000 miles, carrying 10,000 pounds of bombs, and return with 15% of its fuel remaining. A bomber that could fly from America into Germany and back. A task tailor-made for the big flying wing. Walt Cerny, Jack Northrup, and Bill Sears applied themselves to coming up with a viable design. For Jack Northrup, it was crunch time. Time for a large version of the wing to show its stuff. The Army Air Corps contracted Northrop to build one XB-35, wingspan 172 feet. No plane like this had ever been built. Everything housed in the wing, fuel, engines, bombs, crew. No vertical fins, just a flying wing. But first, a smaller version, the N9M, one-third full scale, 60-foot wingspan, designed as a flying test bed and pilot trainer. The first N9M flew on December the 27th, 1942, but was plagued by mechanical failure. Testing on the three later models of the N9M continued through 1943, and the test program was completed by October 1944. August 1990, a secret location in Los Angeles. A group of volunteers is in its seventh year of work on the restoration of the last N9M built. The original planes were made of wood, and the passing years haven't treated it well. So this is a major rebuild, carried out on weekends by a faithful group, many of them old Northrop employees who helped build the same plane in the 1940s. The rebuild is being carried out for the Planes of Fame Museum at Chino, California. This will be no museum piece. Eventually, after years of work, this wing will fly. Well, it takes time, and uh, if this uh, plane had been an all-metal airplane, we probably could have been flying four, three or four years ago. Uh, now we hope to fly sometime next year, but it's been a very difficult project getting woodworkers. That's a skill that's been lost a lot in this country. You uh, find a few average home builders build a wood airplane, but a plane of this type, a magnitude, it's a great undertaking. It's not even being done anywhere in the world anymore out of wood. We've just copied. We've copied all of the wood pieces and glued them together. It's all glued, and it's just been a labor of love, really. We decided to, to make it fly as a tribute to John Northrop. Uh, a lot of people have never seen a flying wing fly. And uh, from all the reports and interviews we've made of the pilots, uh, John Myers and everyone connected with it, it was a good flying airplane, and there's no reason it shouldn't fly. Um, it's like saying, well, there's automobile accidents, people get killed, so what do you do? You take all the, the cars off a freeway? Of course not. Chief test pilot on the N9M program was John Myers. He spent many hours helping to iron out the problems of the design getting the N9M to the point where it was accepted for all its radical shape as a stable, flyable design. Four N9Ms were built, and John Myers last flew the fourth plane, the one now being restored, in 1945. We took him to see the restoration and meet project director John Benjamin. Left wing is pretty well done now, center yeah. section and power yeah. plants. And all the hydraulics are pretty well done and uh, about 40% of the wiring. Absolutely. And we had some people made the new canopy and the uh, windscreen. But does it Beautiful. bring back memories? Or? Oh, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. Yeah. Amazing. Great. I mean, I, I'm ready to go. 
You fly it again? In a minute. Would you? Just in a minute. I always freak you. Go right now. Oh, sure. It was a nice flying airplane. Yeah. Nothing spectacular, but it was just a nice flying airplane. Yeah. John, would you be happy to sit behind him there with him flying? As long as we have insurance, I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> I used to solve that problem with insurance companies for all that's coming around to me to have, a, you know, have an insurance policy. They'd say occupation. I'd say prototype test bus. They'd say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> In the early 1940s, the standard shape of the single-seat fighter plane was the classic low-wing monoplane design, like the P-40 and the famous World War II warbird, the P-51 Mustang. All other countries involved in the war had planes that were basically similar in design and also fairly close in performance and handling. In America, the Army Air Forces were looking for an edge something radical that would allow them to outstrip their competitors and give them combat supremacy in the air. The most unusual looking fighter of the time was the famous Lockheed P-38 Lightning with its twin engines and tail booms. But in the corridors of the Army Air Forces, almost any idea was worth examining. Although there was a good deal of skepticism about Jack Northrop's flying wings, there was also curiosity about their potential. So at the time the Army Air Forces contracted the B-35 long-range bomber, it was also suggested to Jack Northrop that he could think about fighter applications of the wing. With his associates, he developed some wild concepts. The most extraordinary was the flying ram, the XP-79, in which the pilot lay prone to fly a wing designed to slice the tails off enemy airplanes. Mr. Northrop had found out that uh, in a prone position, you could, you could sustain about uh, 14 Gs without blocking up. Also, we weren't uh, hitting anything with our, with our guns. Our gun sights were really, we talked in terms of Kentucky windage. You had to supply your own lead and all the rest of it. So Mr. Northrop, uh, thought that if he could design a, an airplane in which a pure wing in which the pilot lay down so that he could sustain 14 G's or so, that the way to get uh, to knock down enemy bombers was to design a wing that you would fly through a part of the opposing airplane. This is one version of the prototype, the MX-324. The one John Myers worked with had skids and a wheel platform that could be dropped after takeoff. It was rocket powered, but all early flights were towed as a glider. I didn't know anything about rocket engines, of course. Very few people did. And uh, so I decided that I should find out how you run a rocket engine. And Mr. Northrop arranged an appointment for me with uh, Dr. Von Karman out of the the wash, the dry wash near Azusa, which is one of these little towns east of, east of Los Angeles, where they were experimenting with this uh, controlled rocket burning, which had really never been accomplished before. So I said, hey, I'd like to learn how to run one of these engines. Well, the first thing I learned was you don't run one, you fire one. Uh, not much difference, I guess, between running it and firing it, except there's a little kind of thing goes clink up here. <laughs> So I said, well, fine, let's, let's fire one. And uh, they, somebody pushed a button, I guess, someplace, and the bell started to ring, and the red lights went on, and the sirens went, and everybody went around and got behind big rock walls. And I said, hey, wait just a minute. Uh, I'm going to be lying down in this little airplane, and on one thigh is going to be a bottle of red fuming nitric acid, and on the other thigh, the oxidizer, a bottle of aniline, and I said, a rocket between my legs. Now, is there some, is there something dangerous about this? Oh, no, they said. This is Harry Crosby, again in the version with undercarriage. You can see the chin support that held the prone pilot's head up. It was quite an experience. The first flight I made, the airplane had been designed, so that the, I left the landing gear on the ground. In other words, when I became airborne, I'd pull, disconnect, uh, and 
dropped the, the bogey wheels, and, and that left me with uh, just a pair of skids that were kind of a hardened part of the bottom, the belly of this little airplane. And I got to tell you, here you are in this thing, and your nose is down like this, and, and you get to where you realize you've got to put this about this far from the ground, going about 100 miles an hour to land this motor. It's, uh, it, it's a, uh, a mind-expanding experience. This is the MX-324 under rocket power. It's being flown by Harry Crosby, who would soon become the only person to fly the flying ram, the XP-79. There was a lot happening at Northrop in those early years of the 1940s, and Jack Northrop was personally involved in almost all of it. He was a regular visitor to the secret test sites in the desert, anxious to know how well all the theories were working out in practice. Fighter planes and bombers weren't the only possibilities for flying wing development. This is the JB-1, a glider prototype for an unmanned rocket missile. There was one big problem for the pilot of this glider, landing. The wings generated a cushion of air that made it difficult to touch down. It just went on and on and on. Eventually, it would come back to Earth. On uh, weekends, Dad might have something to do down at the plant and uh, or maybe an evening and he'd ask me if I wanted to go down and they had the mock-up of the uh, B, the XB-35 wing also they're working on the XP-56 which I just was uh, very excited about to me it was like a rocket ship and uh, I went down there, and he expected me to be quiet about it and uh, not talk about these things. Because this was wartime, and they were secret projects. Secret. And he trusted me, and I, I didn't uh, tell so on. It practically killed me. The XP-56 was another fighter prototype. It had an enormous Pratt & Whitney double-row radial engine enclosed in the fuselage behind the pilot, with two propellers that revolved in opposite directions. John Myers was chief test pilot. His experience with the plane was not a happy one. It was a, a landing gear failure in the sense that, uh, that after about the sixth hop, I guess it was, that I had made on this airplane, uh, well, a, a tire failed is what it amounted to, really. It was just about that simple. But it developed at the landing gear with a, with a tire with a flat tire uh, was such that the airplane became uncontrollably unstable. In other words, the center of gravity went, went aft at the point of pressure because the landing gear jutted forward. And uh, so it just swapped in and went end over end two and a half times. And fortunately, I was wearing my polo helmet and the <laughs> uh, seat came out, and I came out through the structure with the seat, and the whole hump. My back was broken, and, and I, an ankle, but not, nothing very serious. After John Myers' crash, the XP-56 tests were flown by Harry Crosby in the second plane. This one had a high vertical fin. The whole program was... It was so different then. It was so much cut and try, which is, I, I'm sure hard for anybody who's in any kind of a modern test program to envision that we could have been so stupid. It really wasn't stupid. We just, the knowledge wasn't there. And people say, well, why did you do such a great? Well, weren't you scared? Well, of course, if you weren't scared, you didn't know what was going on. I mean, you start out with that. But we were at war, and, and I felt that was something that I could do, so I did it. Heck yes, I stayed awake a lot of nights. John Myers was lucky to have escaped with his life. Max Constant, an N9M number one, was not so lucky. He had problems with the controls, crashed, and was killed instantly. 
Max Constant, uh, uh, who, who, whom I hired, was a great guy. And he was a very dear friend, older guy. Oh, gosh, he must have been 40, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I hired him, and, and I don't think he lasted two weeks. He was supposed to be doing follow-up work to mine on the N9M, and he was making a, uh, uh, an AF CG test. And, and uh, as we later con reconstructed, he, he, he just did the, the control reversal took over, and he just didn't have enough power to get the, the control wheel out of his chest so that he could get out of the cockpit, and the airplane uh, lost the control. It was awfully hard to go to his widow and tell her that she was a widow, you know. And then came Harry Crosby's turn. After the MX-324 program, he went on to the Flying Ram, the XP-79. The first flight of this extraordinary plane was to be its last. I was standing with Jack Northrup on the desert when uh, when Harry lost, uh, Harry Crosby on the first fl flight lost control of that. And uh, we saw him try to get out, and, and we saw that he was struck by the airplane, which was gyrating pretty wildly at that point. And, and I felt so sorry for Jack Northrup at that moment. There were just the two of us. I was still on crutches. And, uh, and I said, Jack, you know, somebody has to do this, and this is what we get paid for. We know that that is apt to happen. So I don't know whether that's an answer to your question or not. Nobody likes to look at the Grim Reaper, you know. Yep. But there's a combination of two things. The first place, it, 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 it had to be done. And the second place, it's terribly exciting. And maybe there's a third thing, and that is not everybody's doing it, you know. There's, there's a, a kind of a, an elevating feeling to that, I guess. Yeah. You've got to get your kicks somehow. Max Constant dead, Harry Crosby dead. Failures of the XP-56 and XP-79. For Jack Northrup, the situation was made worse by slow progress on his main project, the big flying wing. This XP-35 was a revolutionary undertaking. Jack tried to create the right working climate to make it happen. And I remember specifically Dad saying the words, I want Northrop to be a good place to work. During the war, this Northrop, as a company, was a very small company compared to, say, North American Douglas Lockheed. Uh, it was like a family, and uh, he treated it that way. The, the employees were a part of the family. He called them all Norcrafters. He took an interest in everybody, um, and I think that personal touch uh, communicated between the two and uh, I think that being a part of something totally new in the aircraft business in a sense uh, made it interesting and challenging. Once a week he'd come out on the stage that they had in, in the middle of the parking lot and he'd talk to the employees and bring them up to date on just what's going on and how we were performing on our fulfillment to the war effort. But in spite of the best efforts of Jack Northrop and his staff, this extraordinary plane would never get the chance to demonstrate its ability to fly 10,000 miles with a 10,000-pound bomb load. The program was plagued by delays. There was a lack of cooperation and enthusiasm from the contracting partners. The war was fast coming to an end, and the XB-35 still hadn't left the ground. There had been problems with faulty parts, and even the brightest of Northrop's engineers hadn't been able to iron out the problems of getting power through the complex drive system to the double sets of propellers. And even the propellers themselves refused to work properly. But in spite of all the problems and disappointments, the workforce pressed on, and by 1946, the big plane was ready to fly. It caused tremendous interest as it sat on the apron at Hawthorne Airport, especially with test pilot Max Stanley, a fairly recent arrival at Northrop, but recruited by the injured John Myers after his crash in the XP-56. 
So here I am in my hospital bed and a broken back and a broken ankle. And Max knows that uh, a few weeks or months before that, uh, our mutual friend Max Constant has been killed in N9M. And, and so I'm asking Max Stanley to, uh, to undertake some test work on the, on the Black Widow. And he says, well, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I want to do this. And I said, well, Max, there's really, you know, there's nothing to experimental test pilot. You know? <laughs> I wanted to accommodate him, and uh, it seemed like an interesting way to spend six weeks. And besides, it was going to provide me with an opportunity to meet Jack Northrup, whom I didn't know, but whom I admired greatly because I was familiar with some of his airplanes. And uh, I would welcome an opportunity to meet the, to meet a great man. And uh, he personally interviewed me for the job, and uh, we had a nice little chat for about 15 minutes. And then I was ushered into the personnel department where I was processed, and I emerged as a full-fledged experimental test pilot and had a badge to prove it. The deal I made with him, I, I promised him that he would never have to fly a flying wing. I knew they were developing it, and I had the feeling that it was something far beyond my capability. So one of the conditions I imposed upon my employment was that I would not necessarily be, be asked or required to fly the flying wing. But then as I went to work and I got to know more and more about the flying wing, I began to change, my attitude changed, and uh, I got so I could hardly wait to fly it. But the identity of the test pilot of the XB-35 had not yet been made public, and the plane continued to sit on the apron at Hawthorne Airport. Meanwhile, Max Stanley did have some input into the design of the cockpit layout, but any possibility of him getting a chance to use it was still remote. My immediate boss as a test pilot was the, the uh, chief aerodynamicist, uh, Dr. William Sears, who contributed significantly to the development and the design of the flying wing. And he called me into his office one day and he said, uh, well, you know, we're getting close to the first flight and we think that you ought to be the pilot, or words to that effect. Well, that really stunned me, but it was absolutely overjoyed. I was overjoyed to hear it. And I went out of his office on cloud nine. It was June 1946. World War II had been over for almost a year. The XB-35 was officially in competition with a consolidated B-36 as the post-war long-range bomber, so a great deal hinged on its success. Preparations for the first flight were meticulous. I guess the first decision I had to make was which direction was I going to take off? to the west, which was the normal direction of takeoff of the airport, uh, and, the, and into the prevailing wind. But I decided to take off to the east, uh, downwind, because we would wait for a time when the wind was minimal. But the main advantage I had was I was headed for my destination. We were all being uh, sort of tipped off as to when it was going to go. And we all sneaked out, and Jack Northrop uh, was very a stickler. He'd given orders not to have everybody waiting to have this thing take off because they wouldn't get any work done. <laughs> but we did anyway, and Jack stayed in his own office, watched it out the window, <laughs> and uh, it was quite a sight. This was a, a, a little a flight strip, primitive, was uh, weeds uh, on both sides of the runway, thick weeds on both sides of the runway. And these weeds were infested by large rabbits, jackrabbits. And as I started the takeoff roll, one of these rabbits jumped out of the weeds and started to run along in front of the airplane. And pretty soon it dawned on me, or at least it seemed to me, that I wasn't gaining on this rabbit. And I can remember the thought flashing through my head that, man, that's either one fast rabbit or I'm in a hell of a mess. Well, about that time, the rabbit uh, disappeared back into the weeds, and uh, uh, the takeoff proceeded normally. So we took off and flew straight ahead, climbing to about 10,000 feet, leveled off, and made a left turn over the mountains and descended into the, what was then Muroc Dry Lake.
This was a hot day and the airplane was not air conditioned for this flight. And up there in the bubble, uh, it, was a, it was a hot house. The flight test program of the XB-35 never really got underway. Problems with the complex propeller and drive mechanism continued. And ready to fly was its main competitor, the consolidated B-36, a huge conventional airplane with an enormous fuselage to carry bombs, the exact opposite of Jack Northrop's ideal of a wing that carried everything. At last, the race was on. Which concept? Traditional wing, tail, and fuselage B-36, or radical flying wing B-35, would become the long-range bomber. In an effort to improve reliability, Northrop decided to scrap the propeller system that was causing problems. The double counter-rotating props were replaced by conventional propellers, but performance dropped off severely. There was only one answer. The piston engines would have to go. The design would be converted to take eight of the newly available jet engines. This jet version would be called the YB-49. It was exactly the same airframe, but the result of the conversion was a complete transformation in performance. At last, Jack Northrop was able to see the wing fly as he always hoped it would. The B-49 was an absolute joy to fly. And it was my first experience. As a matter of fact, it was the first experience of most people flying in a jet airplane that was large, roomy, Marvelous performance, very quiet, very smooth, and it was so it was so much superior in every regard to the propeller and airplanes that there just is no comparison. And at the time, I predicted that the flying public was in for a rare treat when there were jet-powered airliners available. And how did Jack Northrop react to the performance of his big flying wing? Well, he was so overjoyed, he was literally jumping up and down. It was, it was uh, probably the, the, the highlight of his career. And it was also a highlight for all the Norcrafters who'd labored through the war years, not only to see the big wing take to the air, but to see it perform brilliantly. The YB-49 flew over. And it had a P-80 chase plane. And after Max passed us, he pulled it up like this and, and, and pulled it around. And that chase plane, it couldn't even start to catch up with him. The control system was unusual. Foot pedals activated clamshells, or drag rudders, at each wingtip. They could be used separately as rudders or together as speed brakes. The wheel controlled a set of elevons, which worked as both elevators and ailerons. Even though the controls were unusual, the aircraft responded to conventional wheel and rudder movement. The Army Air Force's test pilot on the YB-49 program was Major Robert Cardenas. He made the first flight in the second YB-49 produced. Being a little guy, of course, uh, you like to master big things. And this was a big thing. It was a 172-foot wingspan. Uh, it had eight jet engines. Uh, that was the most uh, thrust I'd had. Uh,
take off, the airplane um, just kind of flew off by itself, you might say. In the air, once the gear was up, it was a dream to fly. It had a wheel instead of a stick. If it had put a stick in there, it felt like a fighter pilot. But um, it was uh, sensitive, but not sensitive to the point that you were fearful of something happening. No, and just you had to realize that um, it was sensitive. But it flew, flew very nice. First impression was that, hey, I've got a hot thing here. Mm -hmm. So, basically, uh, the brief would be test that airplane, find out its performance, find out its uh, stability and control and its adaptability as a uh, potential Air Force uh, vehicle to perform whatever task they might design, in this case, uh, a bomber. The testing program revealed some problems arising out of the conversion from the slower piston engine, XB-35. They had not taken into into effect uh, possibly the rate of acceleration on the takeoff uh, which was slow at first but then rapidly increased and so the uh, the gear doors the main gear doors we, we damaged the gear doors because uh, the higher airspeed and uh, then i found out that they had not modified the landing gear to retract faster 35 so I had to pull up rather steeply a lot of people thought maybe I was trying to show off but actually I wasn't and then a triumph on April 26th 1948 Max Stanley set a record for time in the air I was the pilot on the flight to demonstrate that this airplane did in fact have a 4,000 mile range capability carrying a 10,000 pound simulated bomb load so we flew from, um, was, I don't know whether it was Air Edwards by this time or not, I think it was, from Edwards to Phoenix, made a turn, came back to, over Edwards, up to San Francisco, made a turn, back to Edwards, this round robin circuit to, to negate the wind effect. And we flew a total of, uh, there's been conflicting numbers bandied about. Uh, I think the, the best number is 3,950 statute miles. At this stage, Robert Cardenas came off the program to continue his engineering studies. He nominated his friend, Captain Glenn Edwards, as his successor. The friendship we had was, yes, very close. And also my admiration for Glenn uh, Edwards, because uh, actually, as far as the building control is concerned, uh, he helped uh, Dr. Perkins of Princeton write the book on how to do stability and control flight testing in jets. I flew out there with uh, Glenn and checked him out in the B-49. I had full confidence. Uh, in fact, I thought he, he's probably going to do a better job than I could have done. The flight test program took place high above the Mojave Desert. Glenn Edwards was not as enthusiastic about the basic flying qualities of the plane as Cardenas. And in the Northrop camp, there was a feeling that he would not take advice that would have helped him. But in any case, when the YB-49 took off early one June morning in 1948, Major Danny Forbes was at the controls with Glenn Edwards in the co-pilot seat. There were three other people in the plane. It was a routine test flight. The incident that followed was to cement the name of Captain Glenn Edwards firmly into Air Force history. 
That morning, the plane crashed in the desert, killing everyone aboard. Wreckage was scattered across the desert. Rush Slay, who also flew the airplane, happened to be out in the desert at the time. He saw the thing tumbling in. Um, they tell me that at the crash site, that Forbes was actually in the pilot seat. Um, but Glenn lost part of the outboard controls and panels uh, so what he encountered I don't know uh, but it could have been um, uh, uh, well, it was a structural failure why I don't know to this day over 40 years after the crash you can go out to the crash site and pick up small pieces of wreckage of that YB-49. And just over the horizon, at what used to be Murat Dry Lake, Captain Glenn Edwards' name lives on, at Edwards Air Force Base, home of the Air Force Test Flight Center and landing site of a NASA space shuttle. I heard the wing had crashed. I did a 180, went back to my little apartment, and you know, Boyd was on it. He said uh, on the phone, get back up there, find out what happened to Glenn, and uh, finish the tests. For Jack Northrup, enjoying the growing enthusiasm for the plane among some Air Force personnel, the crash was a shock and a disappointment. Well, it was a very severe blow because he recognized that a lot of people were skeptical, still, of anything that was as radical as a, as a flying wing. I felt a loss in losing Glenn, but not to the degree that I was biased against the airplane. As a matter of fact, I felt it my duty uh, to Glenn, in honor of his name, to try to determine what it was and not let his death be in vain to develop a good airplane out of something that had the fundamentals of being a very good airplane. The YB-49 was designed as a bomber, and Cardenas had to assess its performance in that role. Of course, we were using the old Norden bomb site. And um, I remember I borrowed uh, from uh, Strategic Air Command one of their best bombardiers, Lieutenant Colonel, who was the the cream of the crop, and um, he got uh, he got uh, airsick looking down through the peephole of the site because of the, uh, the translation of the land going back and forth like this. The Norden bomb site had been developed in World War II. It was state of the art in bomb aiming technology, but it needed a stable bombing platform. This was not unstable, uh, but it wasn't stable fully. It would go five, four, two, one, 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 one. Finally, you could get it back down to zero, but it took um, quite a long bomb run to get the thing back down to zero. And there were other problems with cockpit and bomb bay design. They were all correctable, but there were still problems. In November 1948, Cardina spoke directly to Jack Northrop. I gave my report on the um, the possible causes of the of the uh, large errors on the bombing run, uh, the marginal stability, and when I got through talking, um. um there was silence, and then Mr. Northrop spoke up, and he said, well, gentlemen, uh, I, I have uh, great respect for Major Cardenas' judgment and his flying abilities. Uh, I believe that um, what he said is um, so. Um, I possibly may have not been totally informed, but Northrop has a lot of work to do. At this point, the Minneapolis Honeywell Company 
modified their autopilot, which was on board the airplane, to serve as a yaw damper. It was a dual function, it was an autopilot and a yaw damper. And when this yaw damper was in operation, it damped out the, the uh, uh, directional oscillations to the point where uh, I think it could be said that it met the specifications. In October 1948, Jack Northrop had received an Air Force order for 30 YRB-49s, a reconnaissance bomber version with six engines, two of them in pods under the wing. Suddenly, there were new players in the bomber game. The Boeing B-47 was a medium-range bomber designed for jet engines and suffered none of the conversion problems the wing had experienced. Although jet engines had increased the wing's speed, they had reduced its range by half, taking it out of the long range and into the medium range class. So the B-47, and not the cumbersome long range B-36, was now the wing's real competitor. At this stage, there was only one YB-49 in existence. And in February 1949, it had a chance to show its stuff piloted by Robert Cardenas with Max Stanley as co-pilot. It flew non-stop from Edwards Air Force Base to Andrews in Washington, D.C. in record time. I was able to penetrate through a cold front that was uh, between me and uh, Andrews Air Force Base, right over the Allegheny Mountains. Um, that was the first time that it had flown in, in uh, severe weather and the airplane uh, was able to fly in severe weather. From takeoff to over the field at Andrews was four hours and five minutes. By the time I circled and landed, it was uh, 4.15, and by the time I was parked, it was 4.25, and that's the official figure, 4.25, but uh, from takeoff to over the field was four hours and five minutes, which was very good. And there were hordes and hordes of people that uh, came out to look at the airplane. The only person that was permitted to board it was President uh, Truman. He and his aides were able to go board the airplane. Well, I happened to be standing near the boarding ladder as he came out of the airplane. And I heard him say to one of his aides, he said, this looks like one hell of an airplane. I think maybe we ought to have some. You know, right at that moment, I was sure that President Truman was the most, most uh, perceptive president we've ever had. It was a triumphant moment for the plane and for the combined Northrop and Air Force crew. But their enthusiasm was about to be dampened. Something very strange was about to happen. On the way back, uh, somewhere out over the Rockies, I began to lose engines. Uh, the gentleman that was in the bubble in the back of the stinger um, started singing out uh, fire on one, fire on three, fire on four, and the flight engineer was uh, chopping off. I lost uh, six out of the eight engines. The only field that was, was within my radius to to get into, which was Winslow, Arizona. And I don't know if you've ever been to Winslow, Arizona. First of all, it's high. Second, the field is not very big. Um, I landed in the first three feet of the runway, and I finally stopped on the last three feet of the runway. Jet engines in those days had a lubrication system that used and then discarded oil. But this should not have been a problem. The maintenance record had been signed off as full of oil and full of fuel. Um, there was no oil inside each cell. In other words, there had been no, and it would have been odd indeed if eight different cells all had the same rupture, but there was no oil coating on the inside. Suffice to say, it was not the fault of the engines. It had sufficient oil that if it had never been filled, I would have had enough to come home. But yet, they weren't. Uh, it is a mystery, yes. Uh, 
I know that several people have uh, have pointed the finger at Sergeant Cunningham, who was my flight engineer and crew chief, and was the guy that signed off on the papers. Either he signed off or a ground crew signed off. When we were getting ready to take off from right field, um, uh, my co-pilot, uh, Captain Pete Sellers, uh, advised me that Sergeant Cunningham had gotten sick and he was going to check in up at the hospital. And uh, I, uh, it's just a kind of a flashback, a deja vu. I thought, gee, you know, <laughs> Cunningham was in the hospital the day that Glenn Edwards crashed. Uh, I said, Pete, go up there and get him. We need him for the flight. Um, some people have uh, taken that story and applied some sinister meaning, meaning to it, especially since Cunningham got killed afterwards on a motorcycle. I, I've looked at all the documents and I've heard that story, and I'm assuming I wouldn't know how you, how you think sabotage on the, on the part of the government, the military, who? Uh, it, it's something, John, I think, that keeps the legend alive. <laughs> The YB-49's transcontinental record was not to stand for long. The YB-49 completed its flight uh, at an average speed of about 511 miles per hour. The following day, the XB-47 made roughly the same flight, and its speed that day was 607 miles per hour. So there was a tremendous difference in terms of the aircraft's performance. And by the late 40s, and certainly all the way through the 50s, speed was the name of the game. The flying wing, with its very thick airfoil, was never going to be maximized for high-speed performance. In 1949, a succession of blows occurred. In January, the order for 30 YRB-49s had been canceled. Air Force tests still experienced bomb accuracy problems in spite of the Honeywell yaw damper, and then the one remaining YB-49 crashed in the desert and burned. This was the end for the YB-49s. The plane had been involved in a series of high-speed taxi tests when the pilot, Russ Schley, began to experience severe nose wheel shimmy problems. The undercarriage had collapsed. The Northrop Company, knowing the program was in trouble, had launched a full-scale public relations campaign to keep the idea of the wing alive. At far-flung bases and remote corners of the globe, large hangars to house big airplanes are usually hard to find. When these planes are repaired and maintained, the men must work in the open, often in bitter weather, which slows them down and makes the task far more difficult and costly in time and money. But not the flying wing. To shelter the wing requires only a small and modest structure, hardly more than a large quonset. Placed on dollies, the wing can be trundled sideways into its hangar, a hangar that is small, economical, and easily constructed. As easy to maintain as it is to house, the flying wing is built low to the ground and can be easily serviced. Short ladders or low platforms available at any airport are all that are required to reach almost any part of even a large flying wing. And if the military rejected the wing, there was still the possibility of passenger transport. The theory was brought to life in this elaborate promotional film. Now, a preview of the flying wing transport of tomorrow. The midsection provides ample room for 80 passengers. The spaciousness keynotes the luxurious main lounge, extending 53 feet inside the wing. And future air travelers will really see something. Through the plexiglass windows of the front wing edge, Passengers have an unimpaired view of the Earth, unrolling thousands of feet below. Coast-to-coast -coast flights in four hours may not be too far away. The dorsal tip of the plane provides an excellent vantage point to see the world go by. Snug as bugs in their magic carpet, air travelers can look down on mere Earthlings as the double quartet of mighty turbojets whistle them through space. The sleek air leviathan carries more cargo farther, faster, and with less fuel than any comparable plane. And the bar will raise the spirits of those who don't feel high enough in the stratosphere. 
The flying wing has the stability of a fine club. The public quickly accepts all the miracles that science provides. Even skyliners like this will become commonplace. But the giant flying wing is more than a super streamlined airplane. It is the fulfillment of scientific vision and symbolizes the practical dreams of science for our world of tomorrow. That dream was never to come true for Northrop. Nor was the dream of the turbodyne engine, which Northrop claimed would have given the propeller version of the wing a 12,000 mile range. And for the many Norcrafters who'd sustained commitment to Jack Northrop's vision for the wing, there was a final blow still to fall. In November 1949, the Air Force canceled work on the program that was converting the remaining XB-35s to jet power. The reconnaissance version, the YRB-49, had still not flown. They said that we were going to reduce our crews. You know, they didn't say that we were going to stop building the wings, but they said we're going to reduce the crews. But the next thing we ended up doing was uh, rolling them all out on the flight ramp, uh, complete or incomplete. One of the saddest days in our lives, I guess, in my life and, and many of the rest of us who believed so firmly in the program and uh, we just couldn't believe that this was happening. All the employees uh, felt about like I did and we all signed a petition that we would finish up the flying wings uh, in our spare time without pay. Jack was deeply moved by this gesture of loyalty and faith in his flying wing but could find no way of, of agreeing with their desire. He tearfully advised them that there was no way the company could assume the liability of completing work on the unfinished YB-49. He had to urge them to forget the idea, for it would have offended the company's principal customer, the United States Air Force. They called us together and they said, uh, we're going to take everybody in the department down on the flight ramp to uh, cut up the wings. So, well, that's what we did. Uh, with the help of the Air Force, the Air Force was, uh, uh, I guess it was Army Air Corps then. We uh, unbolted, drove the, the, the rivets out, disassembled, and put it in uh, big, the big uh, tubs, you know, the alum scrap aluminum. It was sold for scrap aluminum. Uh, we were all really disappointed. Uh, but, you know, the, the company was telling us to do it, so we did it. Jack Northrop's vision, sustained over 30 years of effort, was now destroyed. All hope of saving the wing had disappeared. Since I uh, was aware of what he was doing, he was working toward the flying wing. It was everything. It was his goal. And... Um, it was just devastating. It affected his health. Um, he was not really, for a long time, he was not the same uh, person. He wasn't as jovial, uh, certainly not as happy. Uh, so it had a great impact. Jack Northrop's reaction was colored by the fact that he firmly believed he was the victim of conspiracy and high-level political power plays in the fight for Air Force contracts. At the time, John Myers was vice president in charge of sales for Northrop. Looking back on it, it's, it, it was just naive of us not to realize the tremendous pressures which would be exerted by Convair. Convair was then controlled by a guy named a gentleman named Floyd Odlum, who was the chairman and major stockholder, although he only owned about 5% of the company. That was an awful lot. In the... Consolidated Convair was the manufacturer of the B-36, which in the war years was in direct competition with the wing as the possible long-range bomber. There was still rivalry between the two companies. In July 1948, Jack Northrop had been summoned to a meeting in Los Angeles with the Secretary of the Air Force, Stuart Symington. And present at this meeting 
in addition to the Secretary of the Air, of, uh, the Air Force, was the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Joe McNarney, who curiously later became Chairman of Convair, and Floyd Odlum, who was the controlling stockholder of Convair and a very, a very politically savvy, savvy man. Jack said that as soon as they got there, it was obvious that there was something afoot because Symington stood aside or sat aside uh, with his host and in effect gave him a lecture on just the problem that the Army Air Corps had in supporting two competing companies that both had bombers. Secretary of the Air Force said there are too, too damn many airplane companies. We want, uh, we want Northrop to become a part of Convair. And so Mr. Northrop said, well, Mr. Secretary, what will happen? Suppose it's not possible for us to work this out. The Secretary answered, and I was going to quote him exactly, but I see the women and children in the audience, so I'll use a couple of blanks. <laughs> you will be blank, blank sorry if you don't. The vicious emphasis given the answer shocked not only the Northrop rep representatives, but General McNarney as well. He said, in effect, oh, Mr. Secretary, you don't mean that the way it sounds. And Simon replied, you're blank right, I do. Jack and, and, and uh, Dick Millar talked it over, and they said, we'll take it up to our board, and they did. The board said, we don't think it's fair to our shareholders. In any event, the merger seemed impractical and undesirable to us and we so advised the Air Force. A few weeks later, I received a direct phone call from Mr. Symington, informing me that all our B-49 contracts were thereby canceled. Ted Coleman has written a book about the wing story. In 1987, he wrote to Senator Symington for his version of the decision. Senator Symington replied that he had never chosen any equipment not recommended by the air staff, and that he'd informed Mr. Northrop of the Air Staff's decision to choose the B-36. Mr. Coleman took Senator Symington's advice and spoke to General Curtis LeMay, former Air Force Chief of Staff. He said, I was just, uh, the World War II was over. Uh, I felt we were going to move into the supersonic age, and he said that big airplane had a big thick wing and in my view it was more suitable uh, to have a thin wing airplane for supersonic bomber than to have a big airplane that would have a long range but not high speed. There, there of course may have been some politics involved. It wouldn't be surprising in a major program of this kind that there would be a certain amount of political influence uh, in the situation. However, the airplane was canceled for very good technological and, fi and, and financial reasons, if you will. Uh, if you recall back in the post-war years, it was a time of very lean budgets. And the XB-47 was an airplane that was maximized for, for the medium-range bomber role in terms of its speed and other capabilities. The B-49 uh, had marginal stability as a bomber and as a reconnaissance platform. And, and hence, it would have required a great deal more development and a considerably greater cost at that point uh, to put it into production. Uh, Jack became ill, and his physician advised him to take a long vacation, which he did. But he felt, to be honest with the board, he ought to resign, and he did that in, in all November 1952. One of the things he wanted to do was to get as far away from aviation as he could. He had this very bitter experience, and uh, I know that his connection with Northrop Aircraft was, was non-existent, really. In his long retirement from aviation, Jack was honored many times. He lost money in real estate and dabbled in other interests, including many remarkable inventions. But he never forgot the wing. His passion for it remained as strong as ever. He was convinced that uh, eventually 
uh, the country would get back to the flying wing. Uh, but there was there was so much adverse publicity about the cancellation. Uh, by that I mean that people just assumed that the flying wing was a, was a failure. But he knew that uh, we'd get back to it eventually, and or somebody he hoped that the United States would do it before. Uh, some foreign power. He wanted to make sure that NASA knew something about the wing. And so he wrote a letter to NASA and invited them to come out and visit with him. And he was prepared uh, with some posters, some charts that I had drawn up. A friend of mine is an artist and did this for him. At comparing the conventional with the non-conventional, the wing. That was in 1976. Just after that meeting, he received a letter from NASA saying how they'd been re-examining wind tunnel data on the XB-35 and YB-49, and that their analysis and studies done by other manufacturers of large aircraft had confirmed the superiority of the flying wing design approach as an efficient load carrier. At least the letter made Jack Northrop aware that the flying wing had not been completely forgotten. By 1980, he was an old man in poor health. With all his achievements behind him, he had moved to La Cañada to live with his son's family. But then in April that year, he was secretly cleared by security and taken to a highly classified design area of the Northrop Corporation. Among the people he met there was Dr. John Cashin, co-designer of the B-2. We put a box in front of him, a large cigar box, and uh, asked him to raise a lid and look inside. Now, Jack, uh, at his age, was uh, suffering from Parkinson's disease. And he looked very frail, and he, and, he, and he shook quite a bit. His mind was sharp as a tack. He was, uh, and he was very alert that day. As his, as the shaking hands lifted the lid of the box, and he looked inside, and he picked up the model, tears came to his eyes, and he said, now I know why God has kept me alive for 25 years. You could see that his entire experience with the flying wing was passing through his mind. The B-2, the stealth bomber, is one of the world's most technologically advanced planes. It is designed to move completely undetected behind enemy lines. The late 70s, flying wings were understood aerodynamically and accepted as a viable flying machine. Why it hadn't been applied before in the interim between 1950 and, 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 and 1979, I don't know. We all knew that a large flying wing had been designed and built and essentially met its requirements, its design requirements. The assurance that that had been done certainly was in the back of everybody's mind. There was clear flying evidence. Of, of the aerodynamic viability of a large one. There are some uncanny similarities between the B-2 stealth bomber and Jack Northrop's YB-49. They both have a wingspan of 172 feet. As early as 1948, the clean shape of the YB-49 was known to be difficult to detect by radar. They have both been surrounded by controversy and above all, they are both Jack Northrop's ideal of high lift, low drag efficiency. They are both flying wings.
Mr. Northrop was 30 years ahead of its time, that's what it was. We had to wait till technology caught up with the total system. He was so basic and so decent and so honest and such a lousy businessman and uh, a great a great genius, a great genius. I, Donald Douglas, I heard Donald Douglas once say, Donald Douglas Sr., that Jack Northrop had contributed more to aviation than anybody at his time. It was my privilege to work for him. Thank you.